In a 359 to 43 vote, the House uh, shot down efforts by Representative Marjorie Taylor Greene to oust House Speaker Mike Johnson. And Speaker Johnson uh, joins us now. We are, uh, I don't know why, we, we're just, we're thrilled to have you on. We, whenever you come on, we, we're, uh, I guess we're, we get intoxicated by power, Speaker Johnson. That, that might be it. If we can't have the president or the vice president, then we, you know, majority leader or speaker uh, is, uh, is next in line. Welcome. Thank you. It's good to have you on. Well, it's great to be with you, as always. Power is so fleeting, though, isn't it? You, you, you're, you're in there. Again, I don't know. Uh, I, I, this is what you said. I appreciate the show of confidence from my colleagues to defeat this misguided effort. Hopefully, it's the end of the personality politics, frivolous character assassination that has defined the 118th Congress. Uh, it's regrettable. It's not who we are as Americans. We need to get beyond it. Uh, it could happen again at, at, at the drop of a hat. Right? Is, is that still possible that it can, it can happen at any time? Do you think this makes that less likely? Well, I think it, I think it does. It was an, an overwhelming vote. And I, I think what everyone here, frankly, on both sides of the aisle, we're trying to demonstrate is that we live in very serious times. This is a dangerous time in history, world history, and certainly here on our own shores. And we cannot afford to be playing petty politics here. We, we, th th this country needs a functioning Congress. And if you remove a Speaker of the House, the House closes down. I mean, it's a constitutional office, and so you cannot, you cannot open the doors of the House. I mean, it literally is not operable. And we cannot afford to do that right now. We have hot wars around the globe. We've got massive challenges on our hands. And so everyone here, I think on both sides of the aisles, recognizes that we've just got to move forward and do our job. And that's what I do every day. I'm doing my job. I do what I know to be the right thing. And what I'm trying to do, particularly, is advance our conservative policies and principles, which I believe to be right for the country, as far as I can every day up the field, in spite of the fact that everyone knows we have the smallest majority in U.S. history. I'm at a one-vote margin right now. So right. Not, not a lot of room for error, but we'll keep moving ahead. And I guess it only took... It wouldn't have taken... I mean, you, get, you had 10 if... I mean, that was worse than uh, Speaker McCarthy. I mean, it, it, he could only lose uh, a couple. That, the crazy eight is, is what was there. So there were actually more, maybe, that, that were ready to, to throw you under the bus. But the Democrats, uh, in this case, were uh, de decided that it's better to have you there than to go back into uh, what we would be facing if that happened. But it does... It does seem like for you to prevent it from happening, you need to play ball with them. And I think that's what some conservatives would say, that you're not in a position to buck what the Democrats want. Well, let me say this. Uh, the, the, the handful of people, the, the 10 people, the Republicans that joined uh, Marjorie Taylor Greene in voting against the motion to table, uh, I don't think would have gone the next step and voted to vacate the chair. Several of them told me that. So it was sort of a symbol, symbolic sort of show there. But look, we, we move forward. I have to leave. Um, it, it, uh, Newt Gingrich posted an op-ed last week and said, Johnson has the most challenging speakership since the Civil War over 150 years ago. Yep. Uh, maybe it's true because there's a lot of in interesting factors going on here, but it, we are undeterred in our challenge. What we have to do is fight for the, the things that we know to be right, to fix the country. We have the greatest collection of challenges right now, arguably, than we've had collectively maybe since World War II, maybe the Civil War. And, but we've got to get through this. And so this yeah. is the modern Congress. This is the day of, age of social media. Everybody has their own media platform. They can go online every two minutes and yep. say what they're disgruntled about. But we have to manage that and go forward, and that's what I do here every day. I think Speaker McCarthy uh, w was doing what he thought was right, too, and we saw what happened there. You, on the other hand, were doing what you thought was right, and that's what you always got to do. And it worked out for you. It, do you see any irony that, that what you did for Israel and, and, and maybe bringing on the wrath of some of your colleagues after going through all that? And now President Biden to win Michigan is not sending the, the weapons that country needs to do what it needs to do. Is it, you see any irony in that? Yeah, I do see irony in it, and, and, but greater than that, I see great danger. I mean, what, what the president is doing here is not only defying the will of Congress, to your point, we just voted on this several days ago, but, but he's also trying to dictate, I guess, and micromanage uh, the, the, the war, the defense effort in Israel. Uh, as a condition of supplying the weapons that we all know that they desperately need. I spoke with Prime Minister Netanyahu myself less than 48 hours ago about this situation because I wanted to hear it directly from him. And what they're withholding is precision weapons that are desperately needed 
Here's another irony. The precision weapons are needed to try to protect civilian lives in Rafah. This is, these are the things that they need to do the job that must be done to eradicate the threat of Hamas, who is still lurking there. And, and so for, for them to, for, for Joe Biden to do this, he is, he is going against what he told Congress, what his top officials in the White House specifically told me that they would do. And, and it's uh, just catastrophic policy. Speaker, do you think that President Biden's position is a moral one, meaning that he doesn't want to provide these munitions because he's worried about civilian casualties and believes morally that he doesn't want that to happen and thinks that he can somehow prevent it? Or do you think fundamentally it's a political calculus? Joe mentioned Michigan. I believe it's 100 percent a political calculation. I, I, I think we can all see that. It's the same reason that he's making the political calculation not to call out anti-Semitism on the campuses, not to call out and be, bespeak without equivocation about the good versus evil here, the right versus the wrong. I mean, he has the largest bully pulpit in America. He's the commander in chief. He's the top elected official in our country. We desperately need him to look right into the camera and say, to, to speak with moral clarity, to say what is right and what is wrong. And he is unable and unwilling to do that because he doesn't want to offend a big segment of his base now, his party. There's a there's a, an actual yeah, pro-Hamas, well, pro-Palestinian wing in the Democratic Party. I was going to say he was, was, gonna say he was late. I was going to say he was dragged late, but Speaker, he did, yeah. he did condemn anti-Semitism uh, very recently yeah. in that Holocaust remembrance speech. Yeah, and it was a little, it was too little too late. I was sitting right, you know, 10 feet away from him at that at Holocaust Memorial, and, and someone wrote that for him, and I'm glad he delivered it as he did. Um, the speech that I gave a few minutes before, before he arrived actually at the event, was much more clear and much more direct. And, and look, he needs to do that consistently. He needs to do it every day. This, this is a, a, a problem that is growing across the country. It is not being diminished. And, and we're looking for moral leadership. The country needs moral leadership from both parties and from the top leaders. And he is the top leader in the country. I think he needs to act like it. Mr. Speaker, could, I'm sorry. Okay. Could, could, could a bill pass to defund some, some of these colleges? I, I don't think that could pass. Uh, given, given well, the support that the <laughs> protesters have in certain parts of, of Congress. Well, we're, we're going to find that out because, as you know, l last week, a week and a half ago, um, we, we launched a whole of, of uh, the House effort, whole of Congress effort. We have six committees of jurisdiction, everything from the Ways and Means to the Science, Space and Technology Committee, that are looking at every angle of that. We are deeply concerned about this idea that the Ivy Leagues and these other universities receive billions of dollars of taxpayer funds every year. This is the, the time, the, the, the precious treasure of American taxpayers. They don't deserve it if they can't uphold the basic constitutional rights and the security and safety of their, of their students. And some of them are unwilling to do that. They, they, have, they have demonstrated that. They are kowtowing to the violent protests, and they are ignoring the, the rights and the civil rights of, of their students who pay tuition and, and deserve and have the freedom and the right to go to class unimpeded and unafraid. And, and so that's the problem. So Congress is looking at that. We're looking at the funding streams. We're looking at the uh, generous tax benefits that their endowments enjoy at these big universities and, and also um, the, these foreign student visas. If you come over here and you're an aspiring terrorist, you don't deserve to be on an American campus. You don't deserve to be there threatening your Jewish uh, classmates and peers just because of who they are. And, and we've got to get down to the bottom of that. I think there's a big appetite on both sides of the aisle here to address that. And, uh, and I think that's something the American people will stand and applaud.